Today on Living Power. With the Herodians, and they said, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Now that's just poppycock. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Father, we thank you for uh, the privilege of being here to study your word and to seek your face. And I pray that you'll speak to us today, uh, that you'll, you'll anoint your word in such a way that we can see ourselves and uh, understand what you want from us, what you want out of our lives, and what you demand from us as, as your, not only your children, but your servants. So, Father, give us that insight, I pray, this morning. And for those who watch online, pray that you'll nourish them spiritually and, uh, and bless them also. I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. You know, it's interesting because we are running, on the average, <clears throat> uh, about three times as many online as we are that attend our, our, our class in person. And... Uh, and God's blessed that ministry online. We have people online from literally all over the world. And, uh, and it's, uh, I'm so glad that we have folks that, are, that, are, that consider us to be part of their, their Bible study. And there's nothing any more satisfying uh, to a teacher than to teach. I think it's the greatest honor in the world to teach the Bible to people who want to know about the Bible and, uh, and, and want to study it. And so that's such a great honor. So thank you for that, for that privilege. All right, today we uh, begin a study uh, of a series of very carefully crafted challenges uh, by the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, this is, we call this the last week um, because these are the last few days before the crucifixion. And so Jesus is in Jerusalem, he's there for the Passover, and he's also there because he knows he's going to be crucified. And... Uh, uh, that nobody else gets it at that point. Even the, the, the disciples don't really, don't really get it at that point. And so Jesus is dealing with this, and uh, he, has, he has really put the pressure on the Pharisees and Sadducees. His entire ministry, he's had to deal with that. Now he's really, he's really putting the screws to them and, uh, and really confronting their hypocrisy and their failure and, and their lies. And... Uh, and so, and they're starting to push them. Well, not starting. They have been pushing back all along. And, but it's really getting intense now. And so uh, we saw these three parables over the last few Sundays that, uh, that Jesus used to, to basically reveal uh, the, the hypocrisy of, of, the, of, of the Pharisees and Sadducees and also to uh, reveal his authority, that he was one of authority. And so now... We see over the, next, uh, over the next few Sundays, we'll see how these, the, these Pharisees and Sadducees are really pushing back in a very harsh way. And they, they're really trying to entrap Jesus more and more and more. And we see their, their attempts to be very carefully crafted, as you'll see today. Um, and they want to entrap him any way that they can. Uh, they want to entrap him by treason, the, so he can be accused of treason. That's what we're going to look at today. Uh, they're going to tra try to uh, trap him with doctrinal conflict or blasphemy, so he can be charged with blasphemy. And they're going to charge him or, or, or attack him, uh, accusing him of political insurrection. And uh, at the end of chapter 22, uh, which I think we look at in about three weeks, <laughs> and here we are in the middle of chapter 22, it's going to take us that long because you guys just are so slow. And so I have, you know. And so... Um, Jesus asks a question at the end of chapter 22 uh, of the religious leaders who have just been uh, challenging Jesus just ad nauseum, and uh, he shuts them down. And then in chapter 23, uh, we're going to take a look at the most amazing speech by Jesus that just literally incriminates the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they get so enraged at that point and beside themselves that they decide that they have to kill Jesus. Now, think about this. Can you imagine a bunch of pastors 
and theologians getting together and just being so angry at a man that they decide to kill him. Now, well, I guess if you know deacons, that might make some sense, but um, (laughs) just kidding, all you deacons in here, don't get mad so that you want to kill me because you'll just fit what I'm saying here. Uh, Just kidding. Let's look at this attempt uh, by the Pharisees and in this particular case, the Herodians, uh, as they decide to entrap Jesus and accuse him of treason, a charge, by the way, that would bring down the wrath of Rome, and that was what they were, they were hoping to accomplish. So in Matthew chapter 22, starting with verse 15, then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone else's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard it, they marveled. Now, they weren't happy about it, but they were just like, Whoa, how did he come up with that? They marveled, and they left him and went away. And next uh, next week, we're going to look at the very next group that comes to Jesus on the same day. This day, right now, it's Pharisees and Herodians. And then the Sadducees come uh, just a few hours later. Now, here's this story, and one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this, I want to give you a little bit of a history lesson. Common enemies uh, make strange bedfellows. And here we see the Pharisees teamed up with the Herodians to try and trap Jesus. And it was one of those things where that you see these guys together, the Pharisees and the Herodians, and you go, what is going on here? Because the Herodians were a loose-knit group of Jews who were loyal to Herod and, and to his lineage. And it was Herod the first, by the way, who built or rebuilt the temple of Jerusalem. And it may have been that this group of Jews felt that the Herodian dynasty was the best option for a rule by Jewish client kings. That was a term uh, that was used. In other words, kings that were set up by Rome to oversee Israel and Palestine. And the Herodians had had Jewish roots. They had Jewish connections. And so these Herodians probably felt like they would be the best, since they were already acting as governors and and, uh, uh, different uh, uh, representations of uh, of Rome, that it would make sense for for the Herodian family or that dynasty to move into those positions of kingship, as it were, over Israel and over Palestine. And so they were pro-Rome in one sense of the word. Well, in any case, they were as far at, at the end of the spectrum, as far away as the Pharisees were who hated the Roman Empire. So here were these two groups together in collaboration to try to trap Jesus. And so here they are, Pharisees and Herodians plotting together how to get rid of Jesus, and they come up with a plan Uh, to get Jesus to suggest or imply or maybe outright say that Israel should not be paying taxes to Rome, which, of course, would be considered treason. Um, Now, that was a common thought among the Jews. Uh, Paying taxes to Rome was an obvious sign of submission to Rome, and the trap that the Pharisees and Herodians were trying to set was to put Jesus in a position where uh, he would either alienate a large part of the Jewish population, or he would open himself up to a charge of treason from the Romans. Now, the Pharisees and Herodians opened this challenge with a very flowery uh, address, very flattering, and perhaps suggesting that they had great respect for him and they wished to come to uh, a compromise, to a meeting of the minds, and it was obviously very deceitful. And it says they sent their disciples to him. Those would be uh, other Pharisees that uh, were, weren't quite as uh, advanced in, in, uh, in the system of rule. 
and uh, along with the Herodians, and they said, Teacher, we know that you are true, and you teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Now, that's just poppycock. You know, they don't feel that way at all. And, uh, and then they bait the hook. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this is a trick question. They don't identify what rule of law they're referring to. Is it lawful? Well, you see, are they referring to Roman law or are they referring to Mosaic law, the Old Testament law? And uh, the reference to Caesar differentiates another conflict. Should Israel be paying taxes to the rule of man or to God? Now, the Jews thought they shouldn't be paying taxes to Rome. They thought it was wrong. And uh, uh, because it violated their, their religious beliefs. But Jesus knew exactly what these guys were doing. He understood exactly what they're doing. And he calls them out. And he says, why do you put me to the test, you hypocrites? What are you guys doing? Are you trying to trap me? No. Would you be trying to trap me? Uh, are, you guys, are you guys for real? No, you guys are fakes. You're liars. You're pretending to be something that you aren't. You're asking me a question that you couldn't care less about. And he turns the tables on them. And he calls for a coin. He says, hey, give me a, give me a coin here. And they hand him a denarius. Now, the denarius uh, uh, was, was Roman currency. And it was uh, customary to pay taxes using the Roman currency. That was, they weren't required to do it that way, but they usually did it that way. And those coins were stamped with the image of the emperor's head. Now, you'll see, uh, you can see that on the screen. The one on the left is, is uh, the side with the emperor's head. And on that side, there's an inscription, that, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And then on the flip side, that, that side on the right, uh, on the flip side were the words Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest. And by using that money, by using that, that Roman currency, the Jews were acquiescing that, Ty, that Tiberius Caesar, was, who, who was the current emperor, was divine and was in fact the true high priest, which was a, a horribly offensive to any Jew. And by taking that coin from the Pharisees, Jesus was pointing out that they were affirming that Tiberius was the high priest uh, and not Caiaphas. And so, were they hypocrites for doing that? Yeah, they were. And were they guilty of breaking Mosaic law themselves? Yeah, they were. And were they paying honor to Rome? Yeah, they were. And so there must have been this big collective gulp by the Pharisees because they had been caught at, and Jesus had entrapped them in their own trap. They were asking him, trying to get him to say that they, you shouldn't be paying taxes to Rome, but they themselves were paying taxes to Rome. And in doing so, they were affirming that Tiberius was divine and that he was, uh, he was had, had, he had set himself up, This, by the way, uh, he was the true high priest. And Jesus' comment then is, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God, uh, God's was based on a, a key biblical principle that's really what, what's at, at the base of what Jesus is doing here. The principle is this, God is in control and he's even in control over governments, all governments, good governments and bad governments. He's in control. And uh, in fact, Daniel chapter 2, 21, and these Pharisees, I would presume the Herodians knew this too, the, but Daniel 2, 21 says this, he, God, changes times and seasons, he removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So what, he, what, what Jesus was reminding them of was that Romans were in power because God allowed it or engineered it. And so all of you all of you, all of you all of you 
who have gotten into an argument about whether the Democrats should be in charge or the Republicans should be in charge, should study Daniel 2.21. God puts kings in places and he removes authorities that he wants to remove. And he uses those authorities for his purposes. God is in control. And uh, God will use governments to bless a nation or to discipline a nation. And I can tell you right now, He's done it from the beginning of time, and he's doing it today. And I don't think there is any clearer example of that than in the United States of America. Because America will never stand again until she learns to kneel again. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8 says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap the flesh. Uh, and reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. But what are we sowing? What seeds are we sowing in America today? I'm talking about us as Christians. Because a lot of us just spend time complaining about it. But our calling is to do something about it. Our calling is to sow seeds of faith. That is our responsibility. That's why we're here. That is our calling. Listen, the Bible very clearly says our citizenship is in heaven. We are just ambassadors here. And if we come at, if an ambassador from another nation comes here and just complains about us, we think, send them back. They don't like it, tell them to go back. Well, that's what people say to Christians who complain too. If you don't like it, go back to where you're a citizen of, which is heaven. So we have a responsibility. We're here at this point, at this time and place, because God has called us to sow in heaven faith so in the spirit that is our calling our our job and instead of complaining about the circumstances we need to be sowing seeds of faith and the seeds are, are of the spirit uh, what jesus was saying to the pharisees and the herodians was you pay taxes to caesar by god's authority not by rome's authority you are subject to the law of rome because you are subject to the law of god and God is in charge. And if God chooses to put you under the authority of Rome, that's his business. Pay your taxes. It was a lesson learned by Paul, who, by the way, had been a Pharisee, a major Pharisee. Look at Romans chapter 13 and verses 1, 2, and then we'll drop down to 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Whether you like them or not, authorities are under the authority of God. Whether they like it or not, God is still in control. Therefore, verse 2, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Stop right there. Listen, when we decide that we're going to resist authorities, the authorities that God has put us under, and that God has appointed, we will incur judgment. We will incur discipline. We are a nation under discipline. Verse 7 says, Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Ex uh, respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. It was also a lesson learned by Peter. 1 Peter 2, starting with verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as uh, uh, supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. The difference that we're going to make in America today is by doing good. By sowing seeds of the Spirit, seeds of faith. Live as people who are free, but not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. That's a calling on our lives. That's not, that's not just like, hey guys, be nice. It's not like you should quit talking bad about the government. It's not that. It's live your life in such a way that you honor where God is in your life and what he's doing in and through your life. So once again, Jesus traps 
the hypocritical religious leaders in their own trap. And once again, Jesus' detractors were silenced. Verse 22 says, when they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. And once again, when they should have fallen on their knees in repentance and embraced his truth, they just simply left him and went away. You see, that's what people do that are violating God's terms and plans for their life. They can't face God, they just walk away. They just ignore God. They don't want to have anything to do with God because they're just like, I can't, what do I do now? And once again, Jesus proves that the more you fight God, the greater your loss. And that's true, by the way, whether you're a Christian or not. The more you argue with God, the more you lose. When will people realize? The amazing thing to me is how unrepentant these Pharisees and Sadducees were. Uh, even to the point of ignoring what they, they knew to be the truth. They just flat out hated Jesus so much that they ignored the truth. What motivates you? It's an important question to ask. What is it that stimulates your faith? What is it that motivates you in your daily walk? Is it a connection with God and a desire to please God, or is it just a desire to, to, to be, feel like, like you're okay? What is it that motivates you? What is it that motivates you to disobey God? There's a question. What motivates you either to accept God's calling and will for your life or to reject what God has asked you to do? What motivates you? In a few weeks, we'll see that these same religious leaders went before the governor and to, they wanted to get the governor to arrest Jesus because they hated him so much. And look what they said. Now, we've just studied this. Now, look what they went and told the governor, Luke 23, 2. And they began to accuse him, Jesus, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Now, you see, people who hate God will lie. So will people who say they love God. They'll lie too. But the issue here was that they hated him so much that they wanted him dead. Listen, I don't believe any of us want God dead. But if we don't live like God is alive, then we treat him like he's dead. And so our responsibility is to live like God is alive in us and through us, because he is. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is in us. Jesus tells, tells his disciples, and later on we'll see this at the end of Matthew, he says, look, you know, go into the world and make disciples and baptize them, and I am with you to the end of the age. So we have the presence of God available to us, and so the calling on our life is to live out that presence in our daily walk, no matter where we are, no matter what our responsibilities may be. Our job is to live out the presence of God. And when you live that way, trust me, God's going to put you in some places where those people need to see the presence of God in your life and through your life. It's real easy to sit on the sidelines and condemn the Pharisees and Sadducees, but you know they would point a finger back at us and ask, are you not guilty of the very thing you accuse us of when you reject or disobey God's word and will? Are you any better than us when you still choose to do things your way instead of God's way? What right do you have to condemn us when you are condemned by your own behavior and your own hypocrisy? See, it's something to go to church and it's something to play church. But God has not called us to go to church and to play church. He's called us to be the church, to be the body of Christ, to live out Christ in our world, wherever he chooses to put us, whatever he chooses to do through us. I found myself having to spend time this week confessing my own arrogance and hypocrisy, and it wasn't pleasant. My own failure to render to God the things that are God's Oh, I render the things to Caesar, they're Caesar's, I do that, I pay my taxes. 
but do I really render to God the things that are God's? Things like my life, like my priorities, like my focus, like my ministry. And the answer to, the, to that, as I was thinking about that, is, Dan, you've just proven your arrogance. Because it's not my life, my priorities, my focus, my ministry. It's God's. And so I have to live my life recognizing that I am a tool in God's toolbox. That's my calling, to be the tool that God has called me to be in his toolbox. And he'll use me when he's ready to use me and when I'm ready to be used, when I'm usable. You cannot be used as a tool in God's toolbox if you're not usable. So God calls us to be ready and to be usable and to recognize that he is the king. He is the authority. And let's render to God what is God's. What a fun lesson this has been, isn't it? It's not a pleasant lesson, but man, it's something that we need to hear and we need to understand and we need to imply in our lives. And it may sound like I don't love you, and I love you so much. I do. But I want us to understand. God has called us to be part of his body here in Raytown, in Independence, in Lee Summit, in Kansas City, in wherever it is that you live. For those of you online, wherever it is that you live, God has called you to be part of the body of Christ, a usable part of the body of Christ at work, where God is at work, I mean, in and through your life. Take that calling and run with it this week as you see God put you into places where you are going to have to live out your faith, where you're going to have to be the body of Christ. And you are going to be the only presence of God in the room. Live it out. Live it out. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this painful truth. But it is truth. And we embrace it. And we want it to be real in and through our life. We want to render to you what is yours. We want to give you what you want from our lives. So, Father, teach us that. Teach us to, to, to see that through your eyes, to understand what it is from us that you, that you are expecting. And, Father, in that process, grow us. Uh, my prayer is that you would grow us as a class, not so much in numbers, but in spiritual depth, that you would cause us to grow tall spiritually, that you would cause us to to be that tree that spreads out, that, 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 that branch that spreads out and covers others with your blessing, your truth. Father, we are tools in your toolbox, and we submit to that in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing. 